Welcome yes. back to Life in Review. I'm Josefa Salinas, your host. Well, most people know that I have a passion for the Wolverines uh, because I went to the University of Michigan. Why? Because oh. I'm from Michigan. I'm a girl oh. from Michigan that's living in California, been here for over 30 years. But, uh, yep, Michigan, I'm a Midwestern girl at heart, and that's why when I saw this story, well, I mean, I knew the story originally when it happened, but when I saw the book, I said, we have to talk about this again. People can't forget that this happened. A lot of people don't understand what happened in Flint, Michigan. And so it's very important to me that this story is really talked about because if it happened once, it can happen again. It can happen in your town. It can happen anywhere. There were so many mistakes that were made, but let's get right down to it. Poisoned water, how the citizens of Flint, Michigan fought for their lives and warned the nation. Candy Cooper and Mark Aronson on the phone with us this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, yes. Well, it's wonderful to talk to both of you, and I have to tell you, thank you so much for writing this. I called my brothers who still live in Michigan and uh, told them, oh, my gosh, I'm doing this interview, and they were like, make sure everybody knows what happened. I said, I will. I'm going to spread the word. So let's, first of all, let's get right down to who a little bit about who both of you are, and then let's tell everybody in case they maybe they missed the story somehow, or maybe they were too young and didn't sure. see it. Um, so first, Candy, you want to tell us a little bit about you? I'm from Michigan, too. Yay! Uh, <laughs> and um, I worked at the Detroit Free Press for a number of years. I'm a journalist. And um, I studied in Michigan. I live on the East Coast now, but I grew up in Michigan. So um, this story was very important to me. I've written a lot about young adults and for young adults. And so when Mark came to me with the idea, I really jumped on it. And Mark? So I've been an editor and author uh, for many, many years. And I met with a librarian in Michigan, a wonderful librarian, who said, we need, the, we need to hear the story of Flint written in a way that can speak to young people and to adults, that's so clear and direct that it kind of captured what happened. And I knew she was absolutely right, and I knew I was not the reporter to go to Flint and capture the story. And so my wife suggested Candy, and Candy turned out to be the perfect person to go, go get the story. And I, I was kind of the backstop who could kind of help shape it to make sure we got it right on the page. But Candy was the reporter who who captured the, the words of the people of Flint and and put them into the book. All right, so let's get right down to it. What happened in Flint, Michigan, and when did it happen? Well, in 2014, Flint was broke. So to save money, they switched their drinking water source from the Great Lakes, Lake Huron, to the Flint River. Um, this turned out to be a terrible mistake. The book traces the community response to this and the official attempt to kind of stay the course. So really, basically what happened is that the, the state of Michigan decided that Flint could not make its own decisions about what water to drink, that the state would impose upon them a decision to save money. But from the day of that choice on, the people of Flint knew that this was a mistake. And again, I invite all of you listening to think of this. What if you turned on your tap and the water was brown? What if you took a shower and your hair started falling out? What if your kids were playing in a, in a wading pool in the backyard and came out screaming from a rash? And those were the least consequential consequences. What if you started to find out that there was fecal matter in your water? and that you're supposed to boil it. And then what if you started to hear that people were dying from Legionnaire's disease? All of this is going on, and the state is telling you the water is fine. Shut up. Go home. Accept it. Don't argue. You're just complaining. And that's the negative side of the story. And then there's the positive side of the story. Andy can again tell you about now, the people started um, complaining and marching and having, you know, lots of protests. And there was some national noise surrounding this. First of all, how does how is a city so broke 
that the state says, you know what, eh, you know, you got to save money, so we're not going to let you have this water anymore. We're going to give you this water over here. Now, I know the story of how this, the city became yeah. so broke, but let's tell the listeners how Flint, Michigan, became a virtual ghost town. Well, there's, there's a whole history behind the water crisis that is really helpful to understand um, that has to do with the fact that Flint was a, a terribly segregated uh, city, one of the, the most segregated in the, in the north or in, in the entire country. Um, it, it was called Vehicle City because GM established its, itself there and created a huge number of jobs, and uh, Flint became a boomtown. And then, starting in the 80s, uh, GM decided that it needed to expand outside of Flint, and so slowly GM manufacturing moved away from Flint, and it, it really hollowed out uh, the town. Te- the town eliminated a huge, you know, tens of thousands of jobs and related uh, industries, and um, and that was the start of the the downturn in Flint. Let me tell your uh, listeners uh, something that'll really capture what uh, Kendi's just been talking about. GM complained; it still had a, a plant in Flint, and complained that the water was damaging the parts of the plant. So they changed the water for GM to better water while they forced the people of Flint to drink the water that was too damaging for machines. Now that's startling. But then that's the power of big corporations. And just to kind of further emphasize, um, I don't think people truly understand how big and how expansive the auto industry was in the state of Michigan and in a city like Flint when you're talking about um, every almost everybody having a job at one of the you know auto plants, and you're talking about right. good good paying jobs with you know they were union jobs with great benefits, okay. and people made yep. people made good money, you know families made yes. good money, and when you take these Definitely. plants away in a town like that, I mean that would be like taking the entertainment industry totally out of Los Angeles. Imagine that. That it's totally gone. Exactly. Sony's gone. Paramount exactly. Studios is gone. Universal's gone. They're all gone. And everybody who worked in those jobs from craft services to truck drivers to everybody, no more jobs. Exactly. It would and devastate. Every, every lunch counter, every you know, everybody who who served everybody who worked in those jobs suddenly is serving whom? Right. You know, right. I mean, and it, it, it reminds me of the pandemic a little bit and the shutdown of the economy, you know, worldwide. That's really what happened to Flint when GM left. Things came to a halt. Yeah, I don't think people truly have a grasp of that across the nation because it was so, you know, there wasn't a lot of there weren't protests or anything. The plants just shut down. I mean, my brother was a skilled trades in Lansing, Michigan. Right. Um, he had a, a, right. a job that only two other people in the state had. So he had, you know, he had a skilled job, but still they gave him, you know, the opportunity to go ahead and take that golden parachute and get out of there and um, right. retire, which they did to a lot of people. But it was right. easier in Lansing, I think, than Flint. In Flint, they just came and shut the whole thing down. And all of a sudden, people who were able to provide for their families and pay mortgages and car payments could no longer do that. And then they turned around. And all of a sudden, they turn on their tap water, and brown water is coming out. And they, you know, they went to the streets and, you know, started hollering. So, what happened, and how did it change? Candy, you tell. Um, what happened? Well, the the water. I mean, immediately after the change occurred, um, when they switched to the Flint River, people began to notice, you know, brown water, smelly water, uh, particles floating in their water, a sort of filminess to the water. I mean, there are a hundred different ways that people experienced the water um, and described it. You know, their hair was falling out. Everybody was getting rashes. There were all kinds of internal problems that people were having. And um, what happened is that people in Flint started to complain. And they were going to city council meetings. They were having protests. They were going to Lansing, actually, to try to meet with the governor's office. They were 
um, talking about it in church on Sunday mornings. So it was very uh, much front and center for residents of Flint. And it just, um, they kept being met by denial and dismissiveness and um, the government doing nothing except saying it'll be fine. And finally, you know, they just, they they gathered so much of their own evidence. They they really turned to science for one thing, and there was this big citizen push. And working with Virginia Tech, they gathered nearly 300 water samples from residents' homes around the city. Well, that was three times as many as the state had gathered for their own purposes. And what it showed was very different from what the state had shown, which was that the water was perfectly safe. These uh, tests revealed that the lead levels in the water were extraordinarily high, in some cases as high, you know, surpassing even the levels that you would find in toxic waste. So the people relied on science. Then a doctor came in and proved that this lead was getting into children's blood. So it was kind of a steady march, gathering evidence, falling back on science, and uh, finally presenting it in a way that was just irrefutable. Um, near the end of this, the newspaper, you know, the Detroit Free Press got involved and backed the doctor's claims, and finally the state had to admit that they had made a mistake, the water was poisoned, and they had to do something about it. It was really the the people of Flint that made all of that happen. Josefa, I'd like to say that, and you put it so well when you described the hollowing out that happened when GM left. After that, there was this colossal case of blame the victim. It was easy, easy to look at Flint as if it was broken down rather than that Flint had been victimized by the loss of these good paying jobs as you described. But what the people of Flint managed to do was to change from being being seen as these victims to people who gathered evidence, turned to science, challenged what was being said to them, and proved that they were right. And the, those are the step-by-step ways that they emerged out of the, the, the images that were being spread of them as, and changed into these activists who took control of their own lives. Well, I think one thing that we want to make sure that we reiterate to the audience is this is not something that happened 20 years ago or 30 years ago. In 2019, they were still in capital steps letting everybody know that Flint is still broken, that the lead pipes remaining in the ground, lack of criminal convictions, that this is still happening. 2019, less than 12 months ago, we're still fighting this battle in Flint. This is not something from 1930, 1950. This is something in 2019 that is still being done. And if it can happen in Flint, it can happen in your town. What do you think is happening now in Flint? Well, unfortunately, the pandemic has halted all of the lead pipe replacement. So that was supposed to have been completed, I think, by now, well before now. But it wasn't, and so there are still lead pipes in the ground that need to be excavated, need to be found, and then replaced. Um, until that happens, I don't think Flint uh, residents will use their tap water. Then you still have the Attorney General of Michigan investigating to decide whether there should be criminal charges brought against any of the government officials who were um, making the decisions about Flint. And I think there are also, you know, civil cases pending where people may be entitled to um, some settlements, but um, there's a class action. But uh, the criminal charges, I think, are one of the things that Flint still has its eye on. And, you know, there's a feeling that there hasn't been proper um, Uh, accountability in this case. And I think until there is some, um, it would, you know, it will feel unfinished in addition to the fact that some people will never drink out of their taps again in Flint. I'd like to bring just one thing to everyone's attention. I'd like you to all picture this. We keep talking about water, showers, things like that. Think about formula. 
think about the mothers making formula with their ba- for their infants that has lead in it, and those infants growing up and those families knowing that they were poisoned. So when we talk about how Flint still feels there isn't accountability, when we talk about who's going to pay for this, we're talking about now children throughout their lives who either will have or are experiencing neurological effects or are concerned that they might be. That is the deep level of Flint of of just think of yourself as a mother making formula and you think you're doing the right thing. And think of what you've put into your child because you were given misinformation. And, of course, now the school system is seeing that one in five students uh, are in need of some sort of uh, neurological intervention. Special education has increased by astronomically. And, of course, Flint schools um, don't have the resources to, to manage all that. So this appears to be a legacy of the water crisis that may continue um, for generations. Well, hopefully it won't continue. And with, with books like this, Poisoned Water, Candy Cooper and Mark Aronson, How the Citizens of Flint, Michigan Fought for Their Lives and Warned the Nation. It's a warning signal. It's still going on 2019, 2020. <clears throat> if it's happening in Flint, Michigan, it can happen anywhere. Is there a website where people can go for more information and see how they might get involved in this fight? They can go to their bookstores and pick up a copy and um, find some resources in the book. And let me share another resource right now. It's called the Flint Kids Fund, and it's through the Community Foundation of Flint. If you are interested in becoming involved or perhaps supporting this entire town that has been so devastated by the lack of proper governmental oversight and intervention, please go to the Community Foundation of Flint, the Flint Kids Fund. All right. Well, being from Michigan, I definitely am very passionate about this, but passionate because it can happen anywhere, people. Would you let this happen in your neighborhood? You know you wouldn't. So let's help and fight for the people in Flint, Michigan. Thank you both for writing this amazing book. And please, if there's any new information, please come back and see us. We'd love to update on this. Certainly. Thank you you so so much. much. Have an amazing day. You too. Okay, stay safe. We have had an exciting morning. Brewedforyou.com is where you can go and learn all about coffee. Buy the Avocado Toast was the book all about, you know, not letting debt consume you, learning how to be good to you while tackling your debt. Their social media is You Are Not Your Debt on Instagram and Facebook. And finally, The Flint Water Crisis. The book is called Poisoned Water. It's not a fictional story. It actually happened right here in the United States of America, and it's still going on. If you want to learn more about that or support it, the Community Foundation of Flint, Flint Kids Fund. I'm Josefa Salinas. Until we get together again, stay strong, stay focused, and most of all, stay informed. And as you head out the door for that new normal out there, businesses and entertainment facilities are slowly starting to open or planning to open. Understand that there could be different policies in place for the different places that you go to. Make sure you understand those before you get there so that you know what to expect. Have an amazing week. Don't forget to be good to you.